Hey everyone, I'm JV. <laughs> so that's who the heck I am. Who are you? I'm Dana. Cool. Yeah, so we're da Dana and Davey, and um, we are a senior dev and an early career dev. Do you want to say more about your station in life? I think you have more to say. Sure. Um, so I have been at Fretless now for a year, actually, April 3rd. Uh, I came from General Assembly. I did a four-month immersive full stack web development program there. Um, before that, I was in economic development, a completely different field, and worked with a lot of tech companies in Bloomington. That's where I live, and started thinking, wow, this stuff seems really cool. Did a short little code school while I was there, um, and then decided this is the route that I want to take, so went into the boot camp. And, so what the heck are we doing? We're remote pairing. That's what we're doing. Uh, Fretless does consulting dev work for companies of all sizes. Um, and sometimes we like to pair a program and we do not live in the same town anymore. Um, we tricked her when we hired her. I lived in Bloomington at the time. I moved one month later. So um, she's stuck now. So that's who the heck we are and what the heck we're doing. Where the heck are we doing it? Bloomington and Avon. So, we are pair programming despite being in different cities. <laughs> when the heck are we doing it? Well, we started out pairing 100% of the time. Um, we'll talk more about how we manage that and how we change that over time. We gradually adjusted until we work mostly independently, only pairing when we specifically wanted an extra set of eyes. How the heck are we doing it is the meat of our presentation. We're going to talk about um, the how. The technology we use, um, just general softer tips and tricks for remote pairing and so on. So remote pairing is remote work, right? So all of the advice you've ever heard that applies to remote work also applies to remote pairing and remote pairing is also pairing. So all the tips and tricks you've ever heard about pairing also apply to remote pairing. Why not? But combining the two presents some unique challenges, and that's where we'll focus our talk today. So I'm going to start out with talking a little bit about the softer side of remote pairing, um, like communication. So the quote up here, the most important skill for a software developer is the ability to give and receive feedback without being an asshole about it. I read that recently in an article um, and I loved it and I think it sums it up pretty well. Uh, and so when you add distance and you add all these layers of tools that we'll talk about in a little bit, um, it means that you're going to need probably to work a little bit harder about what you communicate with your remote pair. So from my perspective, um, communication as a junior. Uh, communication can come in the form of just reassurance. So as you're remote pairing, just reassuring that junior that, you know, are you following along? Um, you're doing a good job, whatever that might look like to you. Um, vulnerability, so if you make a mistake when you're driving, um, it's actually really nice for the junior to see you stumble um, and then learn how you troubleshoot that. Uh, breaking things down more often, I'll talk about that in a little bit as well. And then just patience. Um, I know that sounds simple, but it really means a lot when someone's not rushing you along and lets you take your time uh, thinking through a problem. And of course, this all like revolves around the goal of pair programming, which um, is just better quality software, fewer bugs, um, and then mentorship, learning, um, and then just improving the dev team overall. So remote pairing in practice, um, something that I found really helpful in remote pairing is the driver, the person that's actually using the mouse, writing the code, should talk a lot. Um, talk through what you're doing, what your thought process is, what you're thinking, what you're going to try out next. Um, and that might mean you just need like shorter breaks throughout the day or um, pair in like shorter bursts of time. Uh, but it's really helpful to kind of talk along as you're coding. And then as the observer, um, at least I, asked a ton of questions. <laughs> so if they were doing something 
that I just didn't understand or needed him to slow down. Um, asking questions really helped uh, either bring out the information that he wasn't saying or um, just helping me slow down and understand a little bit better. Um, and that's where like the patience and the humility come in uh, when people are just simply trying to understand because that doesn't necessarily mean that they're disagreeing with you or they think the approach you're taking is wrong. Um, it just might be a sign that, you know, number one, you're not talking enough as you're driving. So practice makes better. Uh, nobody's perfect. So in pair programming, you get to see that more often. You watch people make mistakes live, which can be intimidating um, and scary sometimes. But um, if you struggle with communicating in general, um, maybe you're more introverted or you know just quiet, pair programming, pair programming might not come naturally to you. Um, but the only thing that'll make you better, I think, is practice. Um, and for me personally, just learning how to talk through my code and talk about what I'm doing is really helpful to me um, as an as a early career developer. And if you're a bad typist, you're going to be a much worse typist with an audience. <laughs> That's just a fact. So again, maybe a more approachable way uh, is to start through like short learning moments using a pairing session. So an example with Davey and I um, is he was troubleshooting kind of a vague error uh, that he was able to get through quickly and uh, we needed to finish the code, but he later on was like, hey, do you want to debrief that troubleshooting that I did, which was awesome. So later that day, we just did like a short pairing session where he talked through, you know, why he did this. Um, and I think answering the why is sometimes more important than just watching the how. Uh, so you could just sit back and kind of watch how they're doing it, but understanding like, okay, what was your thought process or why did you make that decision to go that direction um, is really helpful. And then pair percentage. Um, so, you know, the, the driver and the observer are the two roles that you can play as pair programming. Um, and as we'll see in a few minutes, there's tons of tools out there, or some really good tools out there that give either person the ability to just take control at any time and drive. And that's really great. Um, but I think we have to all be careful that either the more experienced developer isn't always stealing the cursor or the more confident developer isn't always stealing the cursor um, because that can lead to kind of poor learning environment and just negates the benefits of pair programming in general. And that is the thing that's a little different about remote versus in person. If you're pairing in person, you only have one keyboard and one mouse. So you have to like assault someone to take control when they're driving. But with some of these tools, you can truly just start screwing around with it, um, which, you know, the sort of IT worker stereotype, move, <laughs> just take over. Um, so don't, don't do that thing. So our situation again was a little unusual. Yeah, cool. I know, that's sweet. Um, in that I was pretty straight out of boot camp. I was working with a tech stack that I'd never worked with before or seen in the classroom. Um, and we were working for a client who had reasonable um, but certain expectations of productivity. Um, but we did, uh, it was helpful for us to set goals on how we would divide our pairing. Um, and there are definitely different approaches to this. Some think that juniors should always drive first. Um, but the experience that I had, we had, uh, which I think was successful, um, was that, again, Davey kind of started driving 100% of the time. Uh, and then we set goals to increase my percentage over time um, and then ultimately work independently or when we just needed to, wanted to pair. And the reason I think it was successful is, again, as a newbie, and this is kind of a unique situation, but um, I was able to just watch his workflow um, and see him troubleshoot, learn some best practices, uh, some shortcuts, things like that, that I probably wouldn't have learned on my own or would have taken me a little bit longer. Um, and so that's why I think uh, that is successful. And Davey's gonna talk about some tools now. Yeah, so thankfully there are tools that make this easy. Um, it used to be kind of a nightmare to try to set this up and I will talk about the nightmare that it used to be uh, back when Miles and I were pair programming. Back when he and I actually worked together instead of just theoretically working together like, like we do now. Um, 
And we use all these tools to essentially simulate the experience of sitting next to someone and sharing a screen, mouse, and keyboard. Um, so we have some very specific needs. The ideal solution would involve screen sharing. We must be able to see what we're working on at all times. Um, ideally, we'll both be able to see a code editor and a running build of whatever it is we're working on, maybe even a shared terminal session. Um, so it's more than just being able to look at the same code at the same time. Um, communication is essential as we've established and um, you need a little better than just like Slack when you're um, pair programming. So voice is also, I would say, essential. Uh, although less important than being able <coughs> to hear each other, in a perfect world we could also see each other. Sometimes that's nice just um, for all the obvious reasons. You can see the, the grimace on somebody's face when they're afraid to speak up or whatever. Um, so let's look at some of the tools we can use to address these needs. Needs. Uh, first of all, pour one out for Screen Hero. Screen Hero was a paid service that offered voice chat and screen sharing with separate cursors for each participant. Um, so you could actually, the person who was remote, who was not hosting the session, had their own cursor in the machine and could steal focus at any time, which was really cool and dangerous. Um, but really, really handy because it was not some, you didn't have to jump through a bunch of hoops when it was time to switch drivers. Um, it was great, Seth and I used to use that a lot, uh, but it was acquired by Slack who shut it down um, because they integrated its features into Slack. One of its features, the screen sharing part, not the multiple cursors part. So they ruined Screen Heroes with it. Uh, good news though, there is a product called Use Together which um, operates almost identically to how Screen Hero did. Like Screen Hero, it is $10 a month. There is a free version um, that lets you use it for a whopping 30 minutes a day. Um, so in a pinch, that's pretty cool. If you're actually like trying to work a story together, that's probably insufficient. Um, but $10 a month and only one of you needs to have it. Only the person hosting the session needs to um, have an account. The other person, you can just send them a link and it just works. It's super easy um, to invite someone. So it essentially checks off all the boxes except video because it gives both participants full control of the host machine. So obviously you can see the editor, you can see the terminal session if you've got one up. Um, you don't have access to their server from the stuff running on your machine, but since you have control of their screen, you know, you can just, you're just working off their machine. Um, and it does have voice chat built in, and it's, it's quite clear. Uh, the voice is very high quality. So let's see this in action. Don't take my word for it. So Daner here is going to start a session and invite me. Just copy a link to the clipboard, paste it in Flowdoc, which is better than Slack. I will never stop beating that drum. Until they fix the ready. There, it's too late. Now, too late. now that method of threading is established. It's All right, so see, see my cursor, huh? See how no. it says Davy Struess right there? Isn't that me? You don't. Oh. What? Oh, cuss. Weird. Do you need to move it to another monitor? It's showing. Um, no, it's because um, we need to change it to mirroring now. So uh, here, here. Arrangement. And then we'll have, to, we'll have to change it. Yeah, I could have just done that. Why? I didn't have to point. I could have just taken control yeah. of the machine, right? Yeah, anyway. So, point is, so she's got this thing pulled up here. She's got an Xcode window open here. She's got the, uh, the iPhone simulator up here. So, working on this mobile app together, you have to do more than just share an editor, right? And even, even if you had port forwarding turned on for a server that's running, that's not sufficient because you can't just connect, at least I don't know how to just connect the, um, the iPhone simulator to something like that. So we need to be able to share the entire screen, and we can do that. I can control her machine right here from mine. And it just, it works. And it works really nicely. 
So I'm going to stop her machine from mirroring for a moment just to show that I can do that. Aha! And then I can turn it back on if I want to turn it back on. Cool. So you can end this session if you want. So that is used together, which is a lot like Screen Hero used to be. Um, it is pretty nice. It's pretty fast. The video quality is decent. The voice quality is decent. What if your screen is huge? Huh? What if your screen is huge? Well, then it's going to, it's basically going to full screen it. So it may just be tiny. So that is something to keep in mind, certainly. Um, my advice would be change your resolution and so that you have a low resolution on a huge screen. Um, what do you mean by seats? For a login, there are there is like there are two tiers to the subscription. I don't remember what the other is. Like everything I could ever want to do with it is ten dollars a month. Um, but they have a they have a contact us if you want an enterprise <coughs> account. So so who knows who knows what that is. Um, so Visual Studio Code Live Share is the next tool we'll talk about. And if it fits your use case, it is awfully impressive. For a long time, I really wished this specific thing existed. It does kind of everything that I dreamed an editor-integrated collaboration tool would do. Um, it does a surprising amount. So this time, it's her laptop still that we're seeing up here, but I'm going to start the sharing session because that way you get to see just how wicked this thing is because it does stuff um, despite not being a full screen sharing session it checks off an awful lot of those boxes and I think we even had a slide showing that that we failed to show but that's okay yeah so it does all those things still um, it'll share the editor, it'll share the terminal session it'll share a server, it'll share a voice um, despite the fact that this is just an editor integrated collaboration tool, it is not actually sharing your screen. So, I am going to start a collaboration session in my Visual Studio Code, and I'm going to paste the link in Flowdoc, which is better than Slack. Dane is going to join my session. She is now connected to the Visual Studio Code session that is on my laptop. She is not seeing my screen, but she's seeing my editor session. And you see the files listed, the whole directory structure listed on the left. She does not have these files on her laptop. She has never checked out this repo in her life. Um, this all lives on my machine, and she can just start changing files, go to a different file. Now that did not change which file I am looking at. You can both be browsing the repository independently, even though it's, again, being hosted on entirely on my machine. But if you want to follow the other person, that is one of the, the settings. You can basically say follow, just like in Lord of the Rings Online, if there's a member of your fellowship and they know, they know how to get from Hobbiton to, yeah, anyway. Um, you can just say follow this person and then when they change files, you will change files too. But if you need to, for a few minutes, have one person who is, say, writing the tests while someone else is working on the, the actual model or whatever, um, you can do that even though you're both working from the same machine. It's really cool. But maybe my favorite thing is this. You can also share a terminal session. So I'm going to share a terminal session with her. Um, so if you go to the live share thing there, and click on the terminal session. Oh yeah, I'm still running this through. Uh, let me fill that. <laughs> yeah, there's the prompt. Okay, cool. So now she is connected to the terminal session that is in my VS Code on my machine. Um, so again, she does not have any of this installed on her machine, and she is not sharing my screen. She is running her own copy of Visual Studio Code, and is just connected to the same crap. 
here's the other super cool thing. You can share a server, so you can just tell it which port your server is running on, and it will share that port with their machine. It'll set up the port forwarding and so on for you. You don't have to worry about any firewall settings or any of that. It just works. And it's freaking magic. Check this out. <laughs> Why don't you type um, Rails S. Start a Rails server on my machine. And look what happened. We now have a shared server on port 3000 automatically just because we happened to run the server command from that shared terminal session. And it even opened up a web browser. I don't have this web browser open. This is not Chrome running on my machine. This is Chrome running on her machine connected to port 3000, which is connecting to my port 3000, and it just works. So it does all of this. She can now browse the running build independently of me. We could both be doing this at the same time, um, doing different stuff, which I just think is super cool, because sometimes that's what you need to do. Um, if you're both troubleshooting a problem, it's helpful to troubleshoot it actually together, holding hands or whatever, but um, you can't hold hands from an hour away. So some, sometimes, sometimes, it, <laughs> sometimes it can help for you to both be kind of doing your own research, um, but working from the same, the same development build. So that's Visual Studio Code's live share, which I think is doggone nifty. I'm going to terminate our session. That's what my therapist is always saying, right as things get good. He's going to terminate our session now. Well, oh, well, that's about 50 minutes. Yep, you're right, your mom is a piece of work. <laughs> okay. Good luck with all that. Yeah, so, um, video if you need it. Because in practice, um, since Dana and I both have multi-monitor situations, what we would often do is rather than use the voice that's integrated in VS Code, we would just have an appear-in session going up on one monitor with video and audio, and then do the, the, all the other sharing on the other monitor. So that can be nice too, for all the usual reasons that like eye contact can help. Um, so I'm sure you've all been on video calls through a variety of services, so use whichever one you like. They're all equally horrible. So, huh? They're all they're all horrible. So just pick the one that is least heinous for your connection. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, we both have two monitors, so we'll have a video session going on one monitor, and then our shared coding environment on the other. Yeah. Pretty fine. It's been fine. Yeah. yeah. The VS Code thing does not seem to use a whole lot. Um, Dana's internet is terrible. I <laughs> it really is. Yeah. Yeah, and my, mine, <laughs> mine is kind of amazing, so it does help that one of us has a super stable connection, probably. But yeah, we were able to do all that, and really, the screen sharing was still yeah, crystal we clear. Never as long as you're doing the the um, VS Code thing, of course, since you're not screen sharing, you don't have to worry about sending that much video. Mm -hmm. Um, across, so that's the latency and all that stuff isn't quite as big a concern. Yeah, so that in practice that has worked awfully well for us. Um, yeah, we already talked about that. Um, so if you for some reason just can't abide Visual Studio Code and you can't shell out the ten bucks for use together, um, you may still want to, and maybe you have some solution for sharing an editor because there are other plugins for other editors that at least attempt to do some of the collaboration stuff. What in blazes are they doing? Um, you could go through a lot of trouble and set up port forwarding yourself, and this is what Miles and I used to do. Um, in those days, we both used Vim, he still does, but um, we did everything on the terminal, never took our hands off the dang keyboard. So we would just like run a TMUX session on one person's machine, make sure the SSH was running on a strange port, which is enough of a pain in the neck already, then set up port forwarding on your firewall, hope your internal IP address doesn't ever change, and then uh, open up your firewall on that port, etc. 
get the other person to connect to that, then join the TMOC session, and then you're good. And then you can do all that stuff. Um, that's a pain in the neck. And each piece of that can be made a little easier. There's a, something called Ingrock, which is really nice for just sharing a particular port across a firewall. If you, again, if you don't want to use the thing that's integrated into VS Code, but you've figured out how to share the code, but you want to also be able to independently connect with a web browser to the same development build, then you can use something like Ingrock to share port 3000 or port whatever um, without having to set up all that crap in your firewall or on your router. So Ingrock is pretty cool if you need that thing. Um, then the really hard way, the SSH plus Tmux thing, the Miles and I used to do. Um, for that, there is something called Teamate, which is um, a fork of Tmux that has this whole sharing setup built in. It is made for sharing Tmux sessions. So if you are super command liney people, um, then that might be just the thing for you. If you just cannot abide those dang visual editors like VS Code, or if you still haven't forgiven Microsoft for the 90s. <laughs> so, um, that is briefly our history with remote pairing. Um, we are no longer on the same project, so we're not doing this every day in practice anymore, but we did for, for months and months. Mm -hmm. We were doing at least some of this every day, mm -hmm. and for a while we were doing it practically all day every day, mm -hmm. and we're both still sitting. <laughs> so, it can be done. Thank you, that is our presentation, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>
It's hip now. I need to go get some .NET domains. <laughs> I'm surprised we don't know their name. With a dash and a number in them? Right. <laughs> mm. My first ISP was netusa1.net. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah, netusa wasn't a bad enough name. <laughs> they, they could, then they couldn't even get netusa1.com. Yeah. They stuck the one on the end and they had a .NET. It was bad. NetUSA1.net slash tilde nerf herd was my first uh, my first personal website. Tilde uh, slash tilde something or another is another uh, yeah that's another of the past. You can Sorry. still find you can still find it on archive.org. You can find some versions of that site. Before I start telling you about my G cities Geo Cities site, uh, <laughs> any other questions about or comments about uh, remote pairing? Just curious, did you guys? I know there's kind of a, you know, Microsoft funding both now, but doesn't Adam have something similar to Live Share? I don't know. I, mean, I think they had come out first. It was before the. I'd never used it, but I, I think at one point it was at least some version of that. I didn't know. How there much. was some version of that that I tried quite a while ago, and it was it was um, not nearly this feature rich. Yeah. It didn't work. I don't that remember it doing all the terminal shared terminal and stuff. But. Yeah, it didn't do that. It didn't do the port forwarding automatically, and it didn't. Um, it was the switching between files was not like I didn't get a I didn't get to see the tree from the other person's it was machine. More like a live view of like they're sharing a file and that was it. Yeah, what was in that open file? And I had it once screw up while saving, um, which made me never try it. Never again. use it again. Yeah. yeah so, <laughs> but that was that was in all fairness to them a long time. Ago. Yeah. Has anybody did anybody use Flubits? Oh, I forgot about Flubits. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I was just looking at it because I, I don't know if I have, I might have used it once. What was your impression of it? Or do you still use it? I was actually pretty impressed with it. This was probably nine months ago. But what we were using at the time was Slack or another opportunity because of the Yeah. No, Flubits, it's just, it's, uh, it's like live share for, for multiple, there are multiple Adam. editors. Okay. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's similar to VS Live Share, um, or VS Code Live Share, but they're, yeah, they, they have plugins for multiple different editors. So I could be on NeoVim, for instance, and you could be on Emacs or something, and we could still, it's not going to be. That would be great. awesome. <laughs> it's not as full featured as the VS. Obviously, the VS Code thing is fully integrated, right? You, you both, you're both on VS Code, so uh, there's a lot of efficiency to be gained there. But you know, like you were saying, if you're like, listen, I, I do not forgive Microsoft for the '90s uh, and half of the 2000s or whatever. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And maybe still a little bit for everything up to IE 11 at least. Uh, so I'm not, not, I'm not popping open VS Code. You can use Flubits theoretically. VS Code still has Visual Studio in the name, and that's still giving the willies. <laughs> <laughs> I actually uh, downloaded and used VS Code solely for uh, Live Share last week for the first time, and it was pretty sweet. Uh, like you could pry, effectively pry HJKL out of my cold dead hands. Because uh, I will never stop using Vim in Tmux, but we're in some sort of multi terminal multiplexer. But it was pretty cool. I don't know. Any, any other tools you've used for? Yeah. Yeah. That was when, when I first started using Screen Hero, may it rest in peace, that was actually the thing I was most impressed with was how clear the audio was. Because it seemed amazing at the time. You just have to take my word for it because you can't try it ever again because Slack ruined it. <laughs> <laughs> there is a separate live shares, um, there's a separate uh, um, plugin for live share audio, but if you download the um, or install the live share pack in Visual Studio Code, you'll get them both. 
but it is you start the session separately. When you open up the live share panel, um, it shows you your editor session, your terminal session, your server session, and an audio session. So you, you connect it manually after you start the call. But it is built in. But we never actually use that really in practice. Yeah. I think just for completeness sake, uh, Slack does do screen sharing if you're on one of those corporate plans and you can control each other's computer. Oh, it gives you, you, have to, oh. you have, yeah. It does give you a cursor now? Like, yes, but only if you install from slack.com. The App Store version doesn't do that because Apple won't let you install screen oh. computer takeover software. So it is, but, but it's pretty good if you have a corporate account. Cool. Says scribble on your screen without the. Yeah. Oh, on the calls. Yeah. So, so yeah. like, if, if if you're the yeah. one just listening, you can just like right here. Yeah. Yeah. Circle. Oh, that's kind of cool. Zoom does that as well. Yeah. Really. Yeah, the whiteboard feature is kind of cool. Yeah, I love how like Zoom is IQO. The only thing that makes them different is they're just, they just they're just they just do what they do better. It's, it's yeah. just better. Not even way better. Not even it's like, it's a little better. We're a little better. Yeah, yeah, right. We're an IPO. It's an iterative improvement it's upon what I usually use. Yeah. <laughs> Go with that. Uh, dang it, I forget what else. Oh, yeah. So, who does even like semi regularly remote pairing today? Yeah. Some decent amount. Nice. Depend, I guess depending on how we define semi regularly, right? It looks like. Is it usually with someone with comparable experience, or do the, do you do like early career or experience stuff? Can you hear me? Is it usually with someone like similar experience level, or is it early career and more experience dev, or is it changing? Senior, junior, same level, or okay, yeah. same level. You just pair like you and then another computer that you have in another room, Greg? <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's me and my, my pair that's you know, like this version. You know, so oh, okay. We, we like to call that <laughs> <laughs> Are you, uh, sorry, now we're maybe getting a little bit too deep on Greg in particular, but it, so DevOps at Springbuck, right? Yeah, DevOps just, at Springbuck. We typically use the Slack. Share okay. It's for us. Yeah. Um, cool. Outside of that, like, if you have any major issues with habitat or video quality and audio quality, video quality will typically work around, the audio quality will just move back up the phone calls. Cool. Yeah. All right. What else? No. Good? Yeah. I mean, uh, I think a technique that, that may not work for all the time or for everyone, but I like it when a person who doesn't know what's going on as much is the driver, which forces the person who has an idea of what they want to do to effectively yeah. communicate that to the other person without taking control. Yes, you have to use your words. That's right. That's right. <laughs> use your words, baby. Your hands tied behind you. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, our situation was was unique in that we, we started on this project, they were paying for some productivity and truly this was using a tech stack that she had never seen in her life. This was her first professional programming job and it was not the tech stack that she used in her boot camp. So um, it would have been almost literally tell her every keystroke um, in the beginning. So we did just, it was just like job shadowing right at first and then it became pair programming yeah. gradually. Yeah, so it's kind of kind of a unique situation. Kind of unique, incidentally, does not make sense because unique <laughs> means one of a kind. Either you are or you aren't unique. There are no degrees of uniqueness. <laughs> Just before someone else calls me on that, I'm gonna call myself out. I'm ashamed. Wait, everyone was dying. I'm ashamed. Yeah. <laughs> Take that opportunity I was say to explain uniqueness to you. Can you tell us about somewhat immutable next. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry.